Hey everybody, it's Adam from Pixel, and today I have the great honor and pleasure presenting to you an, a first look at Soul Arts by Michael Samuels, who, if you're a Souls fan like myself, would know him by the name Vati Vidya. Now, I'm going to take a moment, if you don't mind me indulging, to share and to give back to a creator who I hold in very high regard. Vati Vidya, Michael Samuels, has been my favorite YouTuber for as long as I can remember. He's the only one who's ever earned an honorary shortcut button on my browser. When I sit down to paint, I click on Vati's videos, I open Pinterest and Photoshop, I put my headphones on and I get working. I guarantee you any painting video, most painting videos you've seen me do over the years have all had Vati playing in the background. However, on top of that, one of the reasons why I, I'm very touched by this book is because despite the fact that, that Michael is not an artist by profession like myself, I, I, I'm a professional artist and I teach art, he's probably one of the most generous contributors and thoughtful contributors to the artistic community that I hold in very high regard. This is my family we're talking about. Oh yes, and we're, I've got a security guard flying around right now. It's a bit of a hot day, so <laughs> he's just keeping watch, okay? Um, the narration, the thoughtfulness he puts into the narration, the competitions that he came up with that have all culminated into this book is thoughtful, it enriches the artistic experience, and to be completely honest with you, have, has been completely heartwarming to watch that somebody outside the art community has contributed so much. And this book is broken into five chapters that explores five of Miyazaki's games. Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. And it explores a different facet of these different games. So from me to Michael, thank you for your wonderful contributions. Thank you for being such a heartwarming member of the art community. You are officially an honorary member of the artistic community as of today. Congratulations. So before we crack open this book, I first want to make a little nod to the slip cover. If you know anything about Soul's Lore, a lot of this is very suggested. One of the wonderful things about, about um, Miyazaki's work, one of probably the biggest in artistic inspiration to me as an artist and teacher, is he doesn't say things outright. He suggests it. He knew, there's little nuances, little hints, little pieces of the puzzle that you need to put together. And this book reflects that philosophy. Even the cover itself, these little glyphs are actually celestial bodies inspired by the glyphs you see in the Nexus and Demon's Souls. However, when you break into the book, you're going to notice that there's even secret messages, which I'm not going to divulge to you. I'm just letting you know if you get the book, you've got some little sleuthing to do. The book cover itself has a nice velvety, soft texture to it as well. Now, you only saw a little hint of it, but check out this absolutely stunning cover art by Ricardo Emig. Every single character in this piece has been painstakingly detailed. Every detail of every character has their own personality and their own unique ambition. The true sign of a master artist, in my opinion. Ricardo, what a nice introduction to this beautiful book. So, let's crack it open, but I'm only teasing the book. If you know my book reviews, I want you to buy the thing. So I'm not going to give away. I'm not going to give away the cow. I'm just going to. I'm just going to hold the glass, the, the the delicious cup of milk right under your nose, and you're going to have to buy it yourself if you want to taste. Like I said, there's five chapters, and each chapter starts with this rose window, which, if you look through it, is hinting at all of the different submissions in the book itself. So even the design of the book itself have these little subtle design elements that are absolutely fantastic. In this particular case, we're going to explore Sekiro. And I'm going to show you a couple of excerpts that I personally find clever, neat. I, much like Michael, my philosophy is I don't look at people and say, this one's better, this one's worse. It has nothing to do with that. Every artist contributed very meaningful work. But there's certain clever ideas I wanted to share with you just to show you how ins artistically inspiring and how clever these designs are for their own unique reasons. So I have a little list over here and we're going to start with 
We're going to start with, don't look, look away. Page 16, Jari Melgen. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that properly. I thought this wasn't only a clever idea, but this could add a whole dimension to the gameplay of Sekiro itself. A bola prosthetic, meaning prosthetic arm, okay? A bola, and if you don't know what a bola is, it's basically a weighted ball tied to a string. It's a weighted ball tied to a string that you, it's a projectile, and it and usually goes and it'll tie around your ankles or it'll, it'll tie around you. And it's, it, the, the whole philosophy behind it is, is not to assassinate your opponent, rather to incapacitate them. And that's actually something that wasn't implemented into Sekiro, but I thought that would add an entire new dimension, keeping prisoners, you know, it kind of like kind of a nod to uh, Metal Gear Phantom Pain, where you can choose to kill or you can choose to hijack them, to incapacitate them and take them out in a silent way and maybe interrogate them later on from information. I thought this was such a clever idea and something I would very much welcome into an expansion or a sequel to Sekiro. Iwabo by Sean Florence. And the Iwabo directly translates into rock stick. And I thought this was another clever idea that although it's not something I could directly see in Sekiro, I could at the same time, but it would, but it would require the permission by Miyazaki and the design team to pull into a different dimension of design. The Iwabo essentially is this big, huge weighted boulder prosthetic arm that could serve more than one purpose. Number one, as a very powerful bludgeoning weapon to take somebody out, huge oversized heavy rock, but could also be used as a swinging element to create an inertia to pull you across, to, to give you a, a, a long jump or something like that, using that weight to pull you into a different location. I thought, what a clever idea. And I could see this as a way of accessing hard to reach secret locations. If you know anything about Souls game, the Souls games, entire bosses, entire chunks of the game are sometimes hidden behind silly little hidden walls you could completely overlook. And this, I imagine, being something that could bring, could transport you to hidden areas. Being a ridiculously oversized huge rock like that is visually really cool, but also kind of pulls you a little bit away from the known Sekiro philosophy into a little bit more of a realm of the uncanny, kind of like the oversized sword or oversized weapons in Final Fantasy. They're ridiculously, un unrealistically oversized, but it pulls you into more of a fantasy genre that would unlock different things. And I thought that was really cool. Now for the Sekiro section, I'm only gonna show you one more. There's dozens here, but I'm gonna show you one more because when I saw this, I'm sure you'd agree with me if you're a Souls fan, this is one of those, why didn't they think of this? The Moonlight Sword Prosthetic. Designed by Joseph Bramlett. And if you're a real Souls fan, when you have this rich, dense game, getting this little subtle nod to the fans is so appreciated. And in every single Souls game, if you played every single Souls game, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Elden Ring, there is their own version of the Moonlight Sword or the Moonlight Great Sword. And a moonlight prosthetic is such a freaking, why didn't anybody think of that type of idea? And it immediately made me think of that experience, that joy I had. When I played Elden Ring for the first time and I walk down this little watery, watery chasm and I find a cave and I walk in and I go down into the cave and I find a chest and I open it up and then I hear a voice calling me out for trying to steal somebody's treasure. And my reaction was the same reaction that every other Souls fan, I, I, I watched play the game, like Fighting Cowboy, for instance, have. I went, <gasps> Patches? <gasps> patches? Oh my God, is that Patches? And then sure enough, it's Patches and he tries to kill me and then I, 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 I smack him around a little bit. And he goes, oh, please, you know, oh, great person, please don't t kill me and everything. I got this huge grin on my face when I experienced Patches for the first time and I would get that same experience going, <laughs> moonlight prosthetic, just to tie it into the whole Souls genre, what a clever idea. So I thought I had to share that with you because, man, that's so cool. Elden Ring Boss Challenge. Now, I'm a, I'm a big creature designer, and of course, 
I'm on my seventh or eighth playthrough of Elden Ring as we speak right now. <laughs> I'm a little bit obsessed. I think I've tried every imaginable creative spec I can. I'm sure there's more to come. And in this, I want to highlight a couple of pieces that I thought were, again, aren't only really clever designs, but can also um, add a new dimension to the gameplay. This first one, however, I thought was a very clever idea and something that really resonates with me on a personal level artistically. Oh yeah, and check it out. When you get the book, you also get this very cool bookmark, like that, which I thought was very pretty, very elegant. I'll put it right here on the side so you can see it. Um, this character over here, I've always loved decrepit, meager looking characters. And I love the idea of this kind of undead, unassuming character, but with this kind of tall, almost elvish-like elegance, the undead. I've always loved that. Of course, it's going to kick your ass, so get prepared. It is a Souls game character. And I loved, one of the things I thought was particularly elegant was how the artist's name is Celeste C. And the weapon itself has this lovely, elegant C design. What, what, Celeste C, that, that's what I would name the weapon, to be completely honest with you. I thought it was a beautiful name and a beautiful design. And then I saw this and <laughs> I thought, you know what this makes me think of? And remember, these these were not based off of any existing Elden Ring characters. This was all concepting, based off of little information. This character walking on all fours immediately gave me cold flashes, flashbacks to those effing revenants in Elden Ring. My number one most hated enemy in that game. And remember, I'm going to share a very embarrassing story with you. See this remote over here? Thanks to the Revenant. It's the first time in my life, despite how furious I've been at certain bosses, this is the first time I broke a bloody remote. <laughs> it was because one of these little bastards. I got so infuriated after my fifth or sixth time just getting, com getting my ass completely handed to me by this stupid non-boss character that went, God damn it, and I smacked it on the ground and I broke it. And then I went, Wow, I really did that, and I was embarrassed. But yeah, I've got a broken remote. I kept it just as a reminder to take a break once in a while. Play, play in moderation <laughs> because that effing thing. So Celeste, you triggered me with this art and you also enchanted me at the same time. This character, and I thought, this is something that I would love to see implemented in the game. This is Hern the, Hern the Hunter, hopefully I'm pronouncing that pro properly, by Caio Santos. And what I particularly loved about this is, number one, I'm a huge fan of folklore. Half of my paintings are folklore based, you know, like uh, Mavka and Kuchisake Ona and the Wendigo and, and La Llorona, etc., etc. But I can't, I love the concept of a deep, lost, deep in a forest, hidden boss idea. I love that idea. Getting lost in some hidden, haunted forest and coming across this boss that kind of sneaks up on you in the dark. And I thought, what a clever idea. This is not something that I've seen in Elden Ring where you go get lost in a forest, kind of a, a Korok forest type of mystic forest and finding some creature. In a future expansion, this would be such a welcome landscape and a welcome creature as well. The last piece that I want to share with you is actually a three-page spread, and it's a piece by Andre Scherstock. Uh, and again, this kind of makes me think about the about like like uh, like folklorish uh, uh, celestial steed creatures um, and like uh, uh, undead horses and stuff like that. But the reason, the thing I love about this again is there's many beaches, there's many waterside beaches and stuff like that, and the idea of encountering this undead rider boss on the beach is again something I would absolutely welcome into the game and that doesn't exist. This is something that could so easily exist in the Elden Ring lore and it's got this very dark vibe to it, not to mention the design is just absolutely gorgeous. The next chapter is Unseen Lands of Dark Souls. Again, a new concept, environment designs, being able to express something through the environments themselves. This piece, which I just, it's for perfect, for completely selfish reasons. Hopefully I don't want to get too much of a reflection on this. Piece by Zen Cloud, who's very well known on Vadi's chat. You've heard his Zen Cloud's name a million times. I had to, to, to shout out to this piece, not only because I feel it would be such a 
an appropriate contribution to the soul genre, but because I'm a huge Gisław Bekszynski fan. You know, I've got a, his art books, I talk about him every chance I get. I'm a huge fan of this artist, this late artist, Polish artist. And I also, just looking at the design, it doesn't only fit so much into this whole Bekszynski-esque vibe, but the whole idea of these endless towers reaching out into the sky with these rope, these flimsy rope bridges tying these these summits together, I thought was such a an amazing, the vertical, kind of bringing the verticality of Elden Ring into a Souls game, which I thought could be a very clever idea. It fits into the Souls genre in the sense that that these are more, clo these are controlled closed environments versus the open world. And aesthetically, I think this is absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, I had to indulge. This next piece is by Alexander Bokimi Tarantev. It's quite a mouthful right there. And one of the reasons I like this piece in particular is because being also being a very big uh, uh, Kurosawa fan, uh, Akira Kurosawa, I love how much depth and dimension and narrative that the climate can bring into a piece. And one of the things that really struck me about this piece isn't only the design, but it's this, this late autumn first snowfall experience, which is a very beautiful time of year when you get this crisp late autumn air. I'm born in November, so I'm an, I'm a, I'm an autumn baby. And those first very romantic snowfalls where we still have the lush green grass, but now we're starting to get these little patches of snow. And just the whole idea of having this, these, this mixed season could contribute so beautifully to the Dark Souls genre. There's this lovely depth of design that could really contribute a lot to it. So something that I'd very much welcome into the Souls genre for sure. The next concept, which is, again, another brilliant idea, and this was preceding not the original release of Demon's Souls, but Blue Point's updated version of Demon's Souls. And it was exploring what was behind the sixth archstone. For purely Souls reasons is the Iron Baroness. And there's two reasons why I love this design. Number one, it's beautifully drawn. I mean, look at the beautiful details and the, and the, the, the refinement in this design. Very, very much respecting the Souls genre. I can, I, this design really re resonates with me on a personal level. I'm also a very big fan of Corvians, of crows, because that symbol, that's the symbol that I use for my daughter, Chloe. She's my Corvian. All my animals, all my kids have their own spirit animal. And uh, Chloe's is the, is the crow, so that I, whenever I see black birds, I always love that. But what I feel, uh, Titanila Pisivor, hopefully I'm, I'm pronouncing that properly, captured perfectly is very much something in the philosophy of Miyazaki's design. Minimalism. There's a great, if you walk into a room full of all kinds of cool stuff, it kind of negates itself. It, it, it mitigates the power of it. But when you have an entire, beautiful, grand, richly designed environment dedicated to a single little character standing there at the opposite end of the room. I love the minimalism of that design, walking up to this very intimidating still character who's just sitting there waiting for you in this unassuming, very open space and watching this character smear your asshole over the floor <laughs> is an infuriating but very exciting experience. I really love this design. This next page over here is an important artistic lesson. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight it. It's very inspiring for a very, very subtle reason that a lot of us artists can take for granted. These pieces are by Jonathan Gregory Bick. And one of the pieces I want to draw your attention to is this piece down here in the bottom left. Hopefully you can see it. I'll try to, hopefully we're not getting too much reflection. And it's essentially um, just a combination of visual elements that fit perfectly and add a whole new design dimension to the soul genre. Mixing a winter landscape with, a, with an abandoned gothic hamlet, which I think is such a clever idea, this overgrown, small, unassuming little village with little crosses and barrels. There's my little security guard, he's doing the rounds. It's the combination. It's the snowy landscape with the small hamlet. We've seen little variations of things. Think about your creative ideas like Jonathan does here. Think of it as recipes. 
You've got an ingredient here, you've got an ingredient there, you've got an ingredient there. And you pick different combinations and variations of it to create this unique sound, this unique recipe, this unique work of art. And that's very beautifully illustrated here. It almost feels like it's taken directly out of a Souls game, but it's not. And it can add this whole new dimension to the game. This is really, really brilliant. The last chapter, which we'll explore in brief, of course, is Imagining Bloodborne 2, which is next to Elden Ring, one of probably the most anticipated games by From Software. <laughs> it is probably one of the most artistically celebrated games of all times. I, I discovered the reason I first discovered Bloodborne was through the artist Darken, Mike Lim, who was doing Bloodborne fan art. And I'm like, what's Bloodborne? And he had designed the hunter. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And it was it's through him, through a fellow artist that I discovered that in the first place. Well, I wanted to highlight a couple of pages for very, very specific reasons, because they bring a dimension into Bloodborne, which is a very, very specific, dark, gothic visual vibe but fits perfectly, with, fits perfectly with what inspired the Bloodborne aesthetic in the first place. So we're gonna start with this page over here. And these pieces over here are by Eugenia Liza. And what I particularly love about these designs is number one, I don't think, just, just the design of these, these, the rose window and the aesthetics on the floor, the 3D designs that are done here are absolutely gorgeous. These look like shots right out of the game. I mean. These literally look like shots right out of the game. But this particular shot down here, I've been working on for, for months now, something I've been wanting to do for years, which is a, a series of designs based off of Lovecraft, right? Like the Mego and Mother Hydra and, and et cetera, et cetera. And these are, most of Lovecraft's designs are based off of creatures of the sea really explores that most of them explore this is either something celestial or something that's based off of the deep dark scary ocean and these pieces are bringing us into these abandoned ships and all of these cthulhu creatures and all of that kind of thing it explores these abandoned ship locations these swampy watery locations in further depth we only had a little taste of that in the original bloodborne and this is something i would very much invite in a future iteration of Bloodborne. I think it's a perfect thing to explore. And you're going to see moving forward how different artists explored this very concept. As you can see here, another variation of that, but now scaled up. You can imagine an entire series of levels that explore through these this ship, this, this battleship, this ancient ship graveyard. Just imagine how awesome that environment would be how much I would pay. I would pay to have a job to do a design, to, to, to work on designs like this. This is how much I love this concept. I really hope that if and when a sequel of Bloodborne comes out, that they explore this painting and they inspire themselves based off of this by Zachary Gourd Parrot. I love the nickname Gourd. I wonder where you got that nickname from. This last piece that we're going to be looking at today, sadly, is a concept that I feel perfectly piggybacks off of the existing lore of Bloodborne and expands on it in a way that just feels completely seamless, but is very exciting. And it's exploring a whole new town. In the original Bloodborne, we explored Yarnum, the town of Yarnum. In this one, we explore the town of Vjeldinum, which from, just, from a, just from a naming perspective fits perfectly. It's kind of like the evolution, the, the next town over, the bigger town, the rich. And I absolutely love this Gothic, European, French-inspired landscape. I can only, like, just the richness of the design of this landscape, The exp it really inspires exploration. And again, just like that other piece I was mentioning, the Iron Maiden before, I love how we have this big, big, beautifully designed open area, all dedicated to that one enemy who's been designed to navigate this specific space when you encounter him. I love great, lengthy, rich, detailed works of art that are all dedicated to a single impractical purpose, like old antiques. My grandmother used to have these beautiful antiques in her house, these beautiful, ornate, 
coffee tables. You know, I'm just sitting there looking and going, this, this table probably took years to hand carve and design, and it's designed for one purpose, to place your little cup on it. I love people who just let loose and celebrate design. And this piece, as all of the pieces in this book are, it's a celebration of the grandeur and the beauty of humanity in general. This is one of the reasons why I love Miyazaki's work. It's a celebration of the richness of the world that we live in. You feel like you can live in these environments. And I, honest to goodness, to every single artist, including everyone that I haven't mentioned today, you have, from my huge fanboy's perspective, you have paid such an homage to the legacy of Miyazaki's work, to the legacy of Miyazaki's philosophy. And it is touching that at the helm, some, the person who could, who could lend his voice to all of your artistic masterpieces is is a creator is a man who you can tell through his narration and you can tell through his voice you can tell through his focus truly respects the gift that you've shared with all of us so to all of the gifted artists that contributed to this absolutely beautiful book to michael samuels to vati vidya for putting this book together and not to mention lending your, the gift of your voice to this book to help to enhance the entire artistic experience. I'd love to see more of that in books to come. I love reading Michael's thoughts and his lore and how he contributes to these books. I can guarantee, I can say without a shadow of doubt on my face that this is going to be one of the most meaningful and memorable art books you're ever gonna own. I say this with all my heart. So thank you to everybody for watching and take care.